Percutaneous Tracheostomies in Intensive Care Insights and Best Practices Written by Dr. Elliot Bertram Ralph Understanding Tracheostomies in the ICU Elective tracheostomies in the intensive care unit are performed in approximately 10% of patients requiring mechanical ventilation for longer than 7 days. Before the recent COVID-19 pandemic, this represented approximately 12,000 to 15,000 insertions per year in the UK. Two-thirds of new tracheostomies are performed in intensive care units in patients with medical rationale for admission. The indications for tracheostomy in intensive care include prolonged respiratory failure to enable weaning from mechanical ventilation, usually greater than 7 to 10 days, upper airway obstruction, access for pulmonary toilet and removal of bronchial secretions, inability to protect airway and protection from aspiration. The optimal timing of tracheostomy insert is a controversial topic, with limited data available to guide clinicians. It is important to weigh the benefits of continued translaryngeal ventilation versus the tracheostomy procedure. Endotracheal tubes are unpleasant to tolerate, require heavier sedation, and may cause trauma and damage to the vocal cords. Existing medical literature supports three clinical benefits of tracheostomies. Improved patient comfort, earlier discharge from the ICU, and shorter length of stay in the ICU. Tracheostomies are also thought to support significant psychological progress for patients by aiding communication and comfort, reducing the risk of vocal cord damage, and allowing sedation to be weaned. Surgical versus percutaneous tracheostomy techniques. There are two main types of tracheostomy, percutaneous, which will be the focus of the summary, and surgical. The surgical technique involves careful dissection and identification of tissue planes and creation of a stoma. It allows for better control of bleeding and is associated with fewer interoperative complications. The percutaneous method involves the Seldinger technique to guide blunt dilators over a guide wire to create a stoma for the tracheostomy to be inserted through. It has been shown to be associated with fewer post-procedural complications, reduced tissue trauma, and consequently a reduced chance of bleeding. Percutaneous tracheostomies were first introduced in 1955 by Sheldon and others as an alternative to the surgical route. The progressive dilational technique was introduced by a surgeon from New York named Pat Siaglia in 1985, where he used a modified percutaneous nephrostomy set to perform the tracheotomy. This percutaneous technique has been associated with reduced post-procedural complications such as bleeding and infection. Furthermore, no transfer is required of an unwell patient to the operating room with generally improved cosmetic effects. Additionally, PDT is found to be cheaper and more efficient than surgical techniques. With evolution over time, the percutaneous tracheostomy technique has reduced the need for surgical tracheostomies. The absolute contraindications for percutaneous tracheostomy include patient refusal, localized infection, and uncontrolled coagulopathy. Relative contraindications include challenging ventilation and high oxygen requirements. Additionally, Difficult airways or anatomy, for example obese patients, enlarged thyroids, an unstable C-spine, or previous radiotherapy should be considered. The percutaneous tracheostomy procedure explained. Dr. Elliot Bertram Ralph is a senior registrar in intensive care and anesthetics and has gained most of his experience inserting tracheostomies during his last year of training. Having more familiarity with the procedure has given Dr. Bertram Ralph more confidence managing them day to day. Initially, the procedure seemed a daunting task. However, he found learning from expert colleagues who have kindly supervised him and utilizing resources such as the National Tracheostomy Safety Project to be helpful. The following method he describes is based on his clinical experience. The percutaneous tracheostomy is the highest risk elective procedure that happens in the intensive care unit. 90% of ICU tracheostomies are performed percutaneously at the bedside. The Siaglia method means that a minimum of three people are needed at the bedside in a carefully planned procedure. One person is required to manage the sedation and monitor and respond to observations. The second person is required to manage the airway and utilize a bronchoscope to allow the procedure to be performed under direct vision. The final person is responsible for inserting the tracheostomy. With several people conducting the procedure, human factors are important to consider. Appropriate introductions and roles should be established before the procedure, 
and checklists and algorithms should be used to ensure safe patient care. Adequate sizing is important for weaning, to allow air to bypass the tracheostomy for production of voice, while reducing the pressure required to inspire and expire sufficient tidal volumes through the tracheostomy. Dr. Bertram Ralph has found that generally a size 8 tracheostomy is used for larger individuals and a size 7 is used for smaller adults. Dr. Bertram Ralph recommends checking blood tests prior to the procedure, ensuring coagulation is appropriate. The airway of the patient should also be assessed to ensure that the endotracheal tube can easily be replaced orally if required, with the difficult airway trolley on standby through the procedure. The patient should be appropriately monitored with end tidal capnography throughout. Starvation status should also be fitting and the NG can be aspirated before the procedure. Consent is mandatory and if necessary, relatives should be informed and patients appropriately supported to facilitate consent. The patient should be easy to ventilate with minimal oxygen requirements. From experience, good ventilatory compliance and reduced dependence on positive end expiratory pressure allows a procedure to be completed more safely. Patients suitable for tracheostomy ideally should be on less than 50% oxygen with a PEEP under 10 cm H2O and hemodynamically stable with low vasopressor requirements. Dr. Bertram Ralph always scans the neck prior to the procedure by ultrasound to ensure that the tracheostomy can be safely inserted. This is performed to review the depth of the trachea from the skin and to assess if there are any large midline blood vessels that could significantly increase bleeding risk. Once scanned, local anesthetic with adrenaline can be administered subcutaneously to ensure that the patient is comfortable and bleeding risk is further reduced. The position of the patient is also crucial. Slight head-up positioning can reduce venous pressure and bleeding. The neck can be extended by placing a pillow under the shoulders of the patient. The person managing the airway should consider placing the patient onto 100% oxygen, altering the ventilator settings appropriately for a paralyzed patient, and positioning them safely for the neck extension required for easy access to the trachea. Sedation should be increased so the patient is appropriately anesthetized for the procedure and neuromuscular blockade. Then, under direct vision using a laryngoscope, the endotracheal tube with the deflated cuff should be withdrawn so the cuff is visible at the cords. At this point, the cuff should be reinflated under direct vision and ventilation should be re-established. Once this has been completed, a bronchoscope is used to view the trachea from the proximal end. In Dr. Bertram Ralph's experience, having someone hold the tube in place reduces the risk of tube dislodgement. The person inserting the tracheostomy should be fully scrubbed and should have prepared all required equipment. The neck should be cleaned with appropriate solution and a large drape should be used to cover the patient. Often, two drapes are needed, one for the patient's neck and face, ensuring easy airway access, and the second drape over the body in the bed, providing a large field for aseptic technique. The curved single tapered large dilator can be placed in water at this stage, which allows activation of the hydrophilic coating to aid its passage through the tissue. Once the neck has been adequately cleaned and local anesthetic with adrenaline administered, a small safety scalpel can be utilized to provide a small and shallow incision to the skin. After this, you can use a glove finger or some surgical dilators to open the tract. You should be able to feel the trachea and have a good impression of the midline. In most cases, the light at the bronchoscope tip can be visible in the trachea at this point, which provides a clear sight to aim for. There are many approaches to carrying out dilation and subsequent insertion dependent on equipment. Potential complications and considerations. There are risks associated with PDT, including malposition, worsening ventilation or oxygenation, and damage to local structures such as nerves, the thyroid gland, blood vessels, and the trachea. Bleeding is reported in 5% of tracheostomies. For example, puncturing an aberrant anterior jugular vein causes significant bleeding. The risk of death from the procedure is low, but ultimately the one-year mortality rate is around 37%. In Dr. Bertram Ralph's experience, a midline insertion is important to prevent uneven pressure of the tracheostomy on the mucosa leading to ulceration. There is also potential for loss of a patient airway during the procedure. An unsecured airway can lead to decruitment in the more PEEP-dependent patients, resulting in desaturation. Inadvertent extubation, bronchospasm, and aspiration pneumontis can all occur. Posterior tracheal wall injury occurs more commonly in elderly patients who have thinner tracheal walls. 
This has the potential to cause subcutaneous emphysema or pneumothorax. Esophageal injury is rare, but can occur when excessive force is used. Although the minimal traumatic insertion system aims to reduce the risk of traumatic injury. Inadvertent tracheal ring fracture is frequently missed at the time of occurrence. This can lead to tracheomalacia in the long term, where the trachea becomes less rigid and can collapse under negative pressure ventilation, causing airway obstruction. After the insertion, post-operative care and follow-up. A chest x-ray can be ordered post-operatively to assess for complications, although there is evidence a chest x-ray is only necessary after difficult procedures to avoid exposure to radiation and to save on costs. Other important aspects for patient safety include reviewing sedation and ventilation after the procedure and production of a sign above the bed with details of the tracheostomy, including when it was inserted and the type of tracheostomy. The National Tracheostomy Safety Project produce a useful bedhead sign to use. The cuff pressure should be also checked every 8 to 12 hours with a target of between 20 to 25 millimeters of mercury with no leak. After the procedure, the stoma will take around 7 to 10 days to mature and be considered established. The first change of the tracheostomy should be done with the utmost care, with a clear plan for difficulty during reinsertion. Most patients who have a percutaneous tracheostomy on the intensive care unit will only need it for a short period of time. The median time a tracheostomy remains in situ is 28 days, with hospital stays in these patients lasting around 50 days, with wide variations. When a patient is ventilator-free and has had their cuff deflated for 24 hours, decannulation can be considered. This should involve careful MDT assessment to ensure this can be done safely. If the patient is discharged with a tracheostomy from the ICU, it's important that they are placed in an area of the hospital that has the skills to manage tracheostomy. A tracheostomy passport should also be produced, detailing key aspects, for example, the reason of the insertion, schedule for changes, and plan of future care. All patients who have had tracheostomy should be followed up with, with details given to the general practitioner. ICU follow-up clinics also have an important role in reviewing and assessment of potential problems during recovery. Failure of stoma healing, granulomas, tracheal stenosis, and tracheomalacia can occur, and any symptoms should be investigated appropriately. Conclusion The value and risks of percutaneous dilational tracheostomies in the ICU Percutaneous dilational tracheostomies have a significant role for patients in the ICU with potential benefits including weaning from mechanical ventilation and improved comfort. However, they are not without risk and should be performed with caution. Dr. Bertram Ralph has found that the simple insertion kits provided, along with guidance from senior clinicians and various teaching resources, have helped him to improve his technique inserting and managing tracheostomies in the intensive care unit.